Welcome to our class picking guide for the War Within. Not only has gearing been made drastically easier, leveling characters has never been so painless, and Battleground Blitz may draw in more players who have never so much as stepped foot into an arena. Meanwhile, every single expansion we're seeing new specs beginning to entrench themselves in PvP. There are now 30-something specs to choose from. And to make PvP easier and more accessible for everyone, we have completely revamped our revolutionary add-on for The War Within, which gives you the number one UI for PvP with the click of a button. And now, with custom updates to all of our profiles, giving you a ridiculous head start in the new expansion. And speaking of getting ahead, we've also launched a brand new website at skillcap.com, rolling out fresh courses for every class in the game, which guide you step by step through everything you need to immediately start climbing. While everyone's lagging behind and slowly figuring stuff out, Skillcapped guarantees that you will get ahead fast. So much so that everything we offer is backed up by one simple promise that you will gain at least 400 rating while using our service. If you want to skip the guesswork and get an exclusive early season discount, be sure to visit the links below. Now, to preface this video, we can and often do discuss each of these specs for hours at a time. Our goal today is to convey the essence of each spec to help you narrow down your options or prompt you to look into a spec that you might not have tried yet. Now, throughout the expansion's launch, we're going to be releasing our starter courses on YouTube. So if you want any more info on any of these specs, we definitely recommend checking those out. Oh, and one last thing here. We won't be discussing tanks in this video. We have an ethical duty to the community to keep tanks out of arena. Death Knights were once agents of the Lich King. Now, free from his grasp, their new mission is to bully casters in World of Warcraft PvP. If you had to pick a word to sum up Death Knights, it would definitely be something like unrelenting. They aim to bully their target to death. Now, there may be classes with more control than a Death Knight, but Death Knights aspire to be the absolute most disruptive. Whether you're death gripping healers away from their beloved pillar, you're copying a paladin's hammer of justice with dark simulacrum, or you're just overwhelming the enemy with more and more pressure. Death Knights have two resource systems, runes that recharge over time and runic power, which is generated from attacks. For hero talents, Death Knights have three interesting options. Riders of the Apocalypse is the obvious standout here. It's the one that everybody knows and loves. Your abilities have a chance to summon one of the four horsemen to assist you with all of them coming out during your major cooldown. And it replaces Death's Advance with an objectively stronger version of Paladin's Divine Steed. That's a tough fact for Sand Lane to follow, but we like it quite a bit as well. While Riders is proc-based, Sand Lane offers a stacking haste buff that's maintained by Vampiric Strike. And finally, Deathbringer grants the DK Reaper's Mark, a powerful strike that applies a debuff that later detonates for additional damage. So let's move on to discussing the specs. Frost Death Knights are a burst-oriented spec built almost entirely around Pillar of Frost. Every 45 seconds, they grip the healer, stun him, and fire up the meat grinder, cleaving down as many targets as possible to generate maximum pressure. Frost DK is a very approachable spec. It has relatively few buttons, and the burst sequence is easy to execute without being one-dimensional. 45-second burst windows are great, both performance-wise, but also in terms of how it feels. The moment you finish bursting, it's time to start thinking about the next burst. Frost DKs are a terrific spec to learn the fundamentals of PvP. It gets you thinking about the game in terms of setups and cooldown trading. It is so satisfying to death grip a healer into your teammate's leg sweep and proceed to slaughter them. Sure, it isn't complicated, but it's pure. Now let's talk about Unholy. Unholy is a spec that blends together unholy minions, diseases, and shadow magic. And as that may suggest, Unholy is a spec with, well, a lot going on. 
the game designers responsible for designing Unholy, they're absolutely nuts, and we love them for it. Unholy DKs feature every gameplay element that you can think of. Runes, runic power, a permanent pet. You maintain buffs, dots, combo points from Wish. You have five different offensive CDs and don't even get us started on necrotic wounds. Is Unholy a melee or a ranged DPS? Well, here's a better question. Why in the world should you have to choose? We typically talk about specs in terms of their depth but Unholy's appeal lies in its girth. You're juggling just a little bit of everything here. So let's put it another way. Unholy is the equivalent of this. Hit it, Joe! And like a photo player, Unholy can be overwhelming for everyone involved. And at low ratings, DKs can win games by just popping their cooldowns and holding on for absolute dear life. But the joy of Unholy comes from beginning to actually understand all of this chaos. Because when you combine Unholy strengths with DK's overall utility, you feel like the most powerful person in the room. So demon hunters are demon slayers who sought to defeat the burning legion by any means necessary, even to the point of harnessing demonic power themselves. Demon hunters are a hero class directly inspired by more traditional action RPGs. Blizzard were so proud of demon hunter that they implemented this action camera to lean into the excitement. The class is highly mobile with fast paced combat and relatively few buttons. Demon Hunters use Fury, a pretty standard resource. You generate Fury through a variety of mechanics and you spend it on your most powerful abilities. Demon Hunters' single DPS spec is Havoc, one of the most popular specializations in PvP. And it really isn't hard to see why. The spec's damage rotation is straightforward, with Havoc typically aiming to put out constant pressure. Havoc is a spec that flatters you. Everyone who has ever played Havoc thinks they're amazing at it, so it's obviously a great spec for someone looking to dive right into PvP, right? But just because people think it's easy, it doesn't mean it lacks any depth. Havoc has a burst rotation in the true sense of the word. Rather than simply gaining a 20% damage buff and continuing their usual rotation, your burst comes from taking advantage of the sequencing of your abilities. The key abilities being I-Beam, and Essence Break. Again, it feels very action-oriented. It's a bit complicated, but honestly not overly so. And while DH is relatively light on buttons, what utility you do have is exceptionally powerful. Darkness and Reverse Magic both encourage you to support your teammates, and Glimpse is a small element with an enormous skill cap to it, allowing you to immune any CC that you're able to anticipate. Now, between that and the rest of Havoc's control and utility, you can be extremely obnoxious for casters and healers to deal with. Havoc's hero talents both build on the spec's theme of ability sequencing, each one in their own way. Alrachi Reaver develops the same themes as the Essence Break Burst, adding additional modifiers that you can take advantage of. Felsguard is a fire-based tree that enhances your metamorphosis, causing you to explode with AoE damage when you press these minor cooldowns. And while Reaver is all about optimizing your usage of abilities with 8 second cooldowns, Felsguard is concerned with your use of abilities with 30 second cooldowns. So both of these hero talents develop Havoc's core principles, and we think that is pretty dang cool. Havoc's action-oriented gameplay has made it one of the game's most popular DPS since its inception. It's pretty simple without being shallow, and Havoc rarely underperforms. If you think Havoc is boring, well, it's just because you've never pre-glimpsed a stun, right? Druids are shape-shifting hippies who take on the form of various creatures and uh, a tree, I guess, to perform any possible role you can think of. This hybrid theme lies at the core of the class. Each form is associated with a role, and PvP allows the druid to take advantage of whatever form may be necessary. Now, as a simple example here, a druid under heavy assault can shift into bear form, increasing their durability significantly. 
Mastering a druid? Kind of like mastering the Swiss Army knife. It's going to prepare you for absolutely anything that comes your way. Now, it also helps that Cyclone is outrageously overpowered. Like, we say this literally every expansion. But as other CC continues to be nerfed, Cyclone is becoming a more and more just completely obvious outlier. Now, in terms of hero talents, we're not going to spend too much time on them because really none of them are particularly exciting. Keeper of the Grove is a Trent-themed build that just further buffs that specific ability. Windstalker causes flora, vines, and stuff to just grow on other players, either damaging enemies or healing allies. Druid of the Claw simply empowers cat and bear form, and Elune's Chosen is themed around lunar magic, with particular buffs to Full Moon and Fury of Elune. So that brings us nicely to Balanced Druids. Balanced Druids are a caster DPS that takes the form of a Moonkin and use arcane and nature magic against their opponents. Now, in terms of rotation, Moonkins make use of a variety of resources, buffs, and procs in order to deal damage. Their damage is typically really bursty. They're going to build resources and dump them alongside their other cooldowns. Balanced Druids are what we would call pace setters. They're a caster that can dominate a game with their control, setting up these potential kill windows while also using their CC to disrupt the enemy. Now, as a Balanced Druid, you're kind of like, uh, well, an uglier mage. But what you may lack in sex appeal, you make up for with Cyclone. When it comes to team composition, Balanced Druids are among the most versatile in the game. They can pair with basically any other DPS to create an effective threes comp, and this is also a great advantage in Shuffle as well. So if you're someone looking to play a caster, but mages are a little bit too demure for your tastes, Balanced Druids definitely worth taking a look at. Feral Druids are melee DPS who play primarily in cat form. They make use of an energy meter and combo points and damage the enemy through a variety of bleeds and biting attacks. Feral Druids are somewhat of a niche spec here, and they're often regarded as a class with a high skill floor. Their rotation is a little bit more complex than most, and Ferals are naturally pretty dang squishy, relying on appropriate use of kiting and bear form to survive. And while Cyclone is exceptionally powerful in and of itself, Ferals need to be comfortable dealing with interrupts, which is a foreign concept to most melee players. Now, the upside to this is that Feral Druid is a ton of fun and remarkably powerful when it's played properly. In the War Within, Feral has a damage profile that encourages multi-dotting, but its single-target burst is honestly a showstopper. This playstyle synergizes brilliantly with Cyclone, allowing the Feral to build momentum by rotating Cyclones between the enemy healer and your kill target, punctuated with regular, massive bursts of damage. Feral Druids are not easy to play, but Ferals have way more fun while winning than any other spec in the game. Restoration is the Druid healing specialization, and if you haven't noticed, well, we here at Skillcapped have a particular love for Resto Druids. We love Resto because the spec appears simple on its face, but it has some remarkable complexity to it, and it rewards the principles that we're always championing. Our Druid is designed around heal over time effects. These hots take time to apply, and Resto has fairly limited emergency healing. Now, as a Resto Druid, you're heavily rewarded for showing awareness, knowing when damage is coming, and preparing for it early. That can involve making sure to maintain HOTS on players, but it can also include pre-bear forming swaps and similar techniques. Newer players often consider Resto a hard spec, but we specifically designed our course to teach you how to develop a proactive mindset. Resto Druids require a ton of discipline, because like Feral and like Balanced Druids, you can absolutely dismantle the enemy team with Cyclone. However, Resto Druids can absolutely be punished for being overly aggressive, so you need to balance the risk and the reward. So the experience of playing our Druid really involves sitting in the back just chilling, maintaining hots, and assessing the situation. Who's in control? What's about to happen? What's your plan? Which isn't to say that Resto Druid is slow-paced at all, it can absolutely just be total chaos at times, but only when your plans have totally unraveled. Ultimately, what we're describing here are fundamental concepts, 
but no other healer is rewarded for awareness quite like Resto Druid is, and we love it for that. Evokers are, well, whatever this is. It's either like a dragon wizard hybrid type thing or Spider-Man's arch nemesis, the lizard. As evokers are the game's first caster hero class, they are to casters what demon hunters were to melee. Evokers are fast paced, they're mobile, and they have unique and powerful utility on short cooldowns. Now, while most casters aim to play at max range and get sucked toward the nearest pillar, evokers are basically forced to dive right into the fray and just have some fun. Their toolkit's filled with various forms of mobility that all feel different, but kind of keep the evoker from ever staying in one spot for too long. Evokers make use of an essence system, very similar to modern Death Knight runes. The evoker hero talents really don't offer any exciting headline abilities, but they do have a variety of smaller niche effects that we definitely appreciate. The first hero talent tree makes you a scale commander, you're kind of like the general of a Dragon Air Force or something, ordering bombardments from just off screen. Flame Shaper, as the name implies, is a fire themed build. Its signature ability is a heal or damage over time effect. Finally, Chrono Warden is themed around time manipulation, and it's about what you would expect. It offers some cooldown reduction, some haste, and upgrades Living Flame. So jumping back into the specs here, Devastation, the normal of Evoker's two DPS specs. It's a fast-paced, highly mobile caster that excels both in consistent damage along with bursty setups. Now, most casters can dominate a game if they're allowed to just run wild, so the enemy is forced to focus on disrupting those casters. Devastation Evokers are caster DPS that are freed from the tyranny of the proverbial pillar and they are among the best specs for kiting melee DPS. It's about the simple pleasure of using deep breath to just cross the map and stun the entire enemy team, put the healer to sleep before anyone can respond, and just immediately zap someone to death. Now in terms of DPS, Dev relies on a variety of procs, stacking buffs, and damage amplifiers. These can be used to create devastating swifty setups, typically built around deep breath. But you aren't locked into that rigid playstyle though. Dev evokers are currently powerful enough to lean on their consistent damage to get the job done. And to be frank here, you can kind of just get away with just jumping around, spamming disintegrate. This makes it a spec that we are comfortable recommending to just about anyone. Definitely one of the more accessible casters right now, but there is plenty of depth there for those who want it. So let's move on to augmentation which is a weird one. Augmentation is a support spec, which is designed for PvE content. Now, in theory, it's a spec for people who want to contribute to all aspects of the game. It's about buffing your teammates' damage, off-healing, and disrupting the enemy. Now, I say in theory here, because this was a spec designed for PvE content. In order for the spec to work in Arena, some heavy tuning has to be applied. Blizzard essentially tries to turn them back into a regular DPS, toning down the support aspects and scaling up its damage to bring it into line. Now, in its initial form, Augmentation specialized in 30-second burst setups that are structured around even might. But on the beta, Aug's burst has been cut down in favor of a more consistent damage profile. Now, what this means is that Augmentation honestly a little bit fraudulent here. It looks like a support spec with bursty damage, but both its support and its burst damage are far less prominent than you would expect. So if we're honest, we think Shadow Priest or Ret Paladin is definitely going to be a better option for someone wanting to specialize in support. Now while we don't expect Augmentation to dominate the meta in Season 1, we definitely expect it to do well enough. Unless Augmentation is among the top DPS specs, we expect it to be very, very niche. That in and of itself can be its own appeal though. If you want to play something a little weird that your opponents definitely won't be familiar with, Aug is likely going to be a good pick for you. And while Aug's rotation is a bit shallow, there's a bit of fun to be had at its simplicity though. So while Augmentation definitely ain't for us, it might be for you. 
So moving on, let's discuss preservation. All of Evoker's unique elements make Prez a very different healer than the rest. We're always talking about the need for healers to balance risk and reward with their positioning, and what we just told you about how Resto Druids must ought to stay in the back line most of the time, Prez Evokers simply just aren't allowed to hang back like that. You're forced to dive straight into the fray. You need to take those risks, but you also get to reap the rewards on the other side of it. Because you're already in the middle of the fight, it's easy to kick cast, land CC, and deal damage, while of course dealing with the other guys doing the same to you. Preservation deals enormous amounts of damage right now, and it's refreshing to have a healer whose offensive playstyle isn't just about pushing in for CC. The actual healing kit of preservation can be a little bit abstract. It's less obvious where the healing is really coming from compared to Holy Paladins, for example. And we would recommend preservation because it combines interesting healing mechanics with an aggressive, offensive-oriented playstyle. Hunters are a DPS class that combines the themes of Rangers, Survivalists, and Steve Irwin. Hunters are perhaps best known for their pet, who provides a major portion of your damage and offers essential utility for the hunter's survival. We love hunters because they have a very tactical, technical vibe to everything they do. You play a hunter because you want to make everything difficult, just so you can make it look easy. Now, in theory, it is easier for a shaman to hex an enemy than it is for a hunter to run up to the target and drop a freezing trap at their feet. But once you've grown proficient in all of freezing traps' intricacies, it honestly is the more convenient ability to use. No hunter main would swap freezing trap for hex. Now, a similar thing applies to their survivability. Hunters control their own destiny. They are a squishy class that relies on their mobility and defensive usage to live. And while many classes are seeing their abilities pruned and mechanics simplified, hunters, they're arguably seeing their toolkit expanded. For hero talents, each of the options is pretty straightforward. Dark Ranger currently provides the hunter with a simple dot effect with some procs attached to it, but with the upcoming anniversary patch, Dark Ranger is being totally revamped into a kill shot focused build. Sentinel is themed around Night Elf Hunters and their Magic Owl, and applies a debuff to the target and spawning regular lunar storms. Pack Leader is a spec that's themed around you being homies with your pet. It's pretty much in line with the class's existing vibe. Beast Mastery is a specialization centered on pets. The hunter gets a second permanent pet and can call upon a whole menagerie of zoo animals to aid them in combat. Now, because BM Hunter damage comes from so many different sources, all these different dogs, there are limited options to peel the damage. So BM Hunters are typically associated with more consistent, unrelenting pressure than the other Hunter specs. Now, along with its focus on pets, BM is the only ranged DPS spec with essentially zero casting. They're fully mobile, allowing them to kite melee or harass the healer while dealing maximum damage. Now, in the past, Beast Mastery was criticized for its simple rotation, but in recent years, BM has continually had its rotation develop, between BM's rotation getting more complex and other specs having their rotation simplified BM honestly no longer really feels like an outlier. Beast Mastery is a viable option for anyone looking to get into PvP on a ranged DPS. Survival is Hunter's melee specialization. It has a vibe and a pace really unlike any other melee too. It's going to appeal to any players who enjoys playing a melee, but would prefer a lot less Zug Zug. Because Survival is ultimately just another Hunter spec, they still need to do the usual hunter things, kiting melee to survive, and needing to go and trap the enemy healer. What this means is they spend more time at ranged than any other melee, and as part of that, there's plenty of ways for them to attack the enemy from a distance. But when it comes down to it, survival hunters really need to be in melee range if they want to kill something. This creates a really natural pace to survival hunter, where they're content to play defensively before diving right back into the fray to burst the kill target. They're probably the best examples of a spec that can carry the whole game while doing the least amount of damage on the scoreboard. 
Now that isn't to say that survival has to play this hit and run style of play, just that it can absolutely be effective in the right doses. Survival Hunter, definitely not for everyone, but it's been a favorite of ours for a while now, and we expect it to remain strong in the war within. Finally, let's talk about marksmanship. And as the name implies, it is, well, the shooty one. A lot of hunters will insist that marksmanship is the one true hunter PvP spec. The spec deals high damage with the ability to consistently pump or to sit on procs in order to burst the enemy during freezing trap windows. Marksmanship has quite healthy mobility with several key casts being usable on the move. The spec also makes use of various cast time reduction effects. So while the hunter does need to plant their feet occasionally, it's very rare that you're gonna feel yourself becoming a turret. Now, with the War Within, MM appears to be in the best shape it's been in for years. It feels a lot closer to the Kata and Mop eras of Hunter rather than the gimmicky caster playstyle that was introduced in Legion. Now, this makes it very easy for us to recommend Marksmanship to you, especially because we expect it to be Hunter's best spec in Season 1. Mages are your classic wizard types. We've got every type of magic you can think of. Fire, frost, and even purple. So to sum up mages in one word, it would be control. Everything about your play feels deliberate and methodical. Whether you're kiting the enemy DPS, you're landing a back-breaking polymorph on the healer, or executing a brutal burst sequence, mages are the main character of World of Warcraft. Between their three specs, mages rarely find themselves without a meta spec to play. Now, part of the reason for mages' ongoing success is their outrageous utility. Whether it's CC, whether it's mobility, or whether it's defensives, mages have some of the strongest abilities in the game. And they have so much utility that simply just using it all is a key part of mastering the spec. For hero talents, each tree is actually pretty compelling too. Now on the whole, we think Blizzard really took care of mages on this one. What the hell else is new? The first is Frostfire, which grants you two different stacking buffs when you use fire and frost spells, with your filler ability being upgraded to Frostfire Bolt, which provides a stack of both buffs. Spell Slinger is a fairly passive mechanic that causes abilities to fire a splinter at the target, which eventually shatter into a splinter storm. And Sun Fury, which is essentially a Kael'thas themed tree that combines a bunch of different mechanics, most notably a phoenix that spawns during your cooldowns and attacks your target. Moving on to specs. Arcane Mage is a spec that we're feeling pretty good about. Now, over the last few years, it's become increasingly approachable. It's now a solid candidate for a beginner's caster, and it's done that while remaining enjoyable for more seasoned players as well. Arcane Mage is a fairly simple spec to get your head around. They generate arcane charges to spend on arcane barrage, and dealing arcane damage has a chance to proc clear casting, allowing the mage to use arcane missiles. Those three spells, make up the vast majority of your globals, but the spec has enough procs and other stuff going on to keep things pretty interesting. It's not a complex rotation, but it definitely feels good. In Arena, this manifests as a caster that's zippy, pumps out consistent damage with regular bursts every 45 seconds. Now, one notable element of Arcane is that it's limited essentially to one spell school. This can make interrupts feel quite a bit more oppressive, but because the rotation has so many instant spells and isn't particularly complicated, fake casting feels a little less intrusive. Arcane's definitely a really safe spec to pick as your main. You may not love it, but we guarantee that you won't hate it. Fire mages are typically regarded as the ultimate burst spec. They specialize in setups, often coordinating with teammates to get the most value possible out of their combustion. Fire Mage is built around Hot Streak, which allows the mage to instantly cast Pyroblast whenever they land two consecutive critical strikes. Now, fortunately for you, mages are overloaded with effects that increase critical strike and several spells that simply always crit. These are intricate details that we cover in our course, but 
Fire's rotation definitely has a very unique blend of premeditation and twitchiness. Between Fire's increased difficulty over Frost and its more rigid playstyle, Fire definitely not going to be seeing much love going into Season 1. So, if you're looking for a way to feel like you're off meta without actually being bad, Fire Mage definitely going to be the pick for you. The final spec available to mages is Frost. It's a spec with quite a bit of hype around it going into the expansion, and honestly, it's really easy to see why. Frost is built around the concept of Shatter. The mage will freeze the target and shatter them like that, like that one scene in, um, in Terminator 2. The effect, definitely a lot less dramatic in game, with most of your shatters coming from abilities that behave as if the target were frozen. In practice, Frost is built around a variety of different possible burst sequences involving around half a dozen different spells. We cover not one, not two, but four different burst sequences in our course, just for reference. Frost Mage is a spec with a lot of diversity in how it's played moment to moment, but also season to season. Over the course of a game, you're going to burst in slightly different ways based on circumstances, but also the exact build that you play will almost certainly shift as the expansion progresses, and that keeps the spec honestly feeling really fresh. Frost is a spec that many new players find approachable, but it's also a favorite for veteran casters as well, because there's really quite a bit of depth to be found in the sequencing of the abilities, and there's nothing more satisfying than pulling off the perfect burst sequence to delete an unsuspecting target. Monks are a class that is themed around Chinese martial arts, or as it's otherwise known, Kung Fu. We have got it all. Chi, attacks inspired by animals, spirit animals, and most importantly, we've got some great vibes along the way as well. But we can be a little hypocritical, because all monk mains need to have absolutely huge egos, and we can't help it. The class flatters us. Monks are arguably the most fragile class in the game. They have to avoid and preempt damage in order to survive. But fortunately, monks may have the best mobility in the game as well, with transcendence being particularly powerful. So even though you have tremendous defensive options, you're always one bad mistake from death. So you always feel like you're dancing on a knife's edge, and it makes every single game exciting. There is no better feeling than pulling off a death-defying play and getting to imagine the other player throwing his hat on the ground like Yosemite Sam. Now, even if it was a total fluke, you own that moment. You won. Now, on the subject of Monk's hero talents, Conduit of the Celestials is the obvious standout for both specs. It allows the Monk to summon each of the four August Celestials as pets, both as individual procs and all together. The other two really aren't that particularly exciting. Shadow Pan causes the monk to build a stacking buff that's periodically dumped into an attack. Master of Harmony allows the monk to gather a portion of damage and healing done as vitality. Now that stored vitality is released as healing when the monk uses Thunder Focus T, turning it into kind of a throughput cooldown. So let's roll over to the specs and we're gonna start with Windwalker. Windwalkers sit at the intersection of a bunch of different melee. They have two resource systems, energy and chi. They also have a mechanic called combo strikes, which incentivizes them to never press the same attack twice. Now the result is a spec that plays like absolutely no other melee in the game, and the spec has a flow to it that kind of feels really satisfying. There's also a surprising emphasis on pets, with all of Windwalker's cooldowns involving pets. Windwalkers are typically associated with burst damage. One of the most iconic compositions in Arena is Windwalker and Frost DK, who would build themselves entirely around leg sweep setups. And while that certainly does remain a core part of the spec's identity, we're seeing Windwalker gradually shift more towards consistent pressure as time goes on. Windwalker monks are typically one of the rarer melee DPS, but Windwalker mains are some of the most diehard of any other spec. But those few who do get it, love Windwalker to absolute pieces. Mistweaver is a healing specialization with two vastly different playstyles available to it. 
and that may impact whether the spec appeals to you. Their first archetype is a fairly standard healing model themed around Healing Mist. The monk can sit at the back and pump enormous healing into a single player. Now, in this role, the monk will typically be very defensively minded, pushing in to CC the enemy healer only when it's safe. The other option is Fist Weaving, where the monk throws caution to the wind and heals people by kicking the enemy in the head. It's literally almost the complete opposite of a casting build. The monk is constantly in the enemy's face and it's going to avoid running away if it's possible. It's an entirely aggressive playstyle that typically pairs with melee cleaves. So obviously, each of these builds have very different appeals. The ranged build is similar to a Resto Druid, rewarding smart play and minimizing risk, whereas Fist Weavers are absolutely psychotic. If there was any justice, both of these specs would be equally viable at any given time. Sadly though, justice is kind of more of a paladin thing, so Mist Weavers can expect the viability of these builds to vary from season to season. Paladins are knights who specialize in wielding the light to both heal friends and smite foes. Paladin's central resource is Holy Power, which fuels the class's most powerful abilities. Support is a defining theme for the class, with all specs having access to a variety of iconic buffs for both the Paladin and their allies. Whether it be providing teammates with Blessing of Freedom, or using Divine Shield to save yourself from imminent death, Paladins have so much utility that it really defines the class. For hero talents, Paladins have the option of Lightsmith, which allows them to provide allies with sacred weapons, offering passive buffs. Herald of the Sun allows the Paladin to apply either damage or healing over time effects to other players and empower them during Avenging Wrath, or Templar, which is entirely themed around dropping hammers on the enemy's head, with Hammer of Light being a particularly satisfying button to press. Shifting into the spec discussion here, Paladin's utility makes Retribution the absolute go-to melee for anyone wanting to support their team. Now, you may remember Retribution as a spec with poor mobility and a reliance on long, lengthy cooldowns, but after much love from Blizzard here, the spec's weaknesses have definitely become some of its strengths. The spec now has some of the longest arms of any melee, and with Freedom and Steed, their mobility options can be quite respectable. Rhett can play with the traditional 60-second burst sequence that'll be familiar to many returning players, but Rhett now has Radiant Glory, which teases the possibility of 30-second setups, which are devastating in their own right. Between burst windows, Retribution uses its defensive utility like Blessing of Sacrifice and Protection to help out the healer. Of particular note is Blessing of Sanctuary. Rhett's off healing can also make the difference in some circumstances. This allows Retribution to impose their will on every aspect of the game. They can support their teammates, they can control the enemy, and they can secure kills with their own setups. This makes Retribution a great option for players looking for a well-rounded PvP experience, or better yet, you have major trust issues and you just need to be involved in absolutely everything. Holy is a healing specialization that emphasizes cooldown trading and positioning. For new players, Holy is arguably the best spec to learn how to heal because it emphasizes fundamental skills in its processes. And because of that, Holy retains a very high skill cap. Now, in terms of moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, Holy relies on casting strong single-target heals. They're most comfortable standing 40 yards away from the action and just absolutely spamming Holy Light. But that desire for self-preservation is countered by the insane potency of Hammer of Justice and Repentance. This allows Holy Paladins to easily insert themselves into setups and frequently set up cross CC. Now, the need for intention can also be found in Holy's healing kit, with a massive toolbox of different cooldowns. Now, a lot goes into making the most of these tools, and the best Holy Paladins are gonna consider the pace of the game when they use their defensives. But while we're making Holy sound like a pretty hard healer to play right now, we do view it as a great option for new healers as well, because it gets you thinking about everything. Priests are casters who have mastered both light and dark, and with that, anything is possible. 
As a class, priests have an enormous kit of unique and, well, frankly, overpowered utility. We're always highlighting how nuanced each of these abilities can be. Simply having a bunch of tools this impactful is reason enough to play a priest. Now, in terms of hero talents, there's actually a lot that we could talk about here. Oracle grants the priest Premonition, which is one of the abilities that we are most excited about in The War Within. In fact, this wound up being one of the longest hero talent videos we made on our website launch, since Premonition has a lot to min-max. Void Weaver allows the priest to open an entropic rift that damages enemies within the effect while providing the priest with several buffs. It is the basis for setups every 30 seconds or so. And finally, Archon is themed around the ability Halo. Now, on its face, it looks like a terrible option for PvP, but the tree is deceptively powerful due to the various buffs and the various procs that are associated with it. It's all honestly a can of worms, so let's move on to Shadow Priest. When it comes to the fun factor, Shadow is one of the easiest casters to recommend. Shadow is designed in a similar way to Unholy Death Knights, with a wide array of different mechanics that results in a variety of different possible playstyles. Shadow Priest's core resource is Insanity, which it generates from numerous effects and then spins it on Devouring Plague. The spec is best known for its multi-dotting, generating resources to fuel single-target damage. But depending on the tuning and the build that you're running, the exact flavor of the gameplay is going to vary, so we guarantee you that no matter what, you won't be bored playing Shadow. Shadow Priests benefit a lot from instant cast damage, so they are a lot less oppressed than some other casters. And in terms of team composition, you can pair a Shadow Priest with basically any other DPS and get an established threes comp. Hell, they can play with just about anyone in twos as well. Now, for all these reasons, Shadow is seemingly the first choice alt for every caster. It's a popular spec, and it's popular for a reason. Discipline Priest is a healing specialization that's themed around Absorb Shields and Atonement. If you're a caster main looking to transition over to healing, this may be an ideal pick for you. Atonement is applied to allies through healing spells like Power Word Shield or Radiance, and this is going to cause your spell damage to heal these players for a portion of the damage done. Now, while doing that, simply spam Power Word Shield on your priority target, and boom, you are a Disc Priest. This can be daunting initially since it stresses your ability to seamlessly swap between healing and damaging targets, but with some practice and the right setup, you can definitely get the hang of it. Discipline also has some wildly powerful defensive cooldowns at their disposal as well. These can help the priest keep things under control between bursts of healing. And the last few updates to Disc have also aimed to make them a little bit more approachable for newcomers. This has come at the cost of making the spec feel a little bit more shallow. However, if you're a DPS looking to pick up a healer, Discipline, definitely a great pick. Now, when it comes to flavor, Holy Priests are the vanilla of healing specializations. But don't let that simplicity fool you here. There is a lot to like about the modern iteration of Holy. Their kit is overwhelmingly focused on healing throughput. No absorbs or damage reductions here. They just make health bars absolutely go up. Now, in terms of rotation, Holy has a well-balanced toolkit. You have access to quite a bit of instant cast healing, whether it be small maintenance buffs or emergency buttons. And when you need to just spam cast healing, Spirit of the Redeemer provides that freedom, as long as your teammates don't grief you. Holy Priests are absolutely overloaded with cooldown reduction, resets, and charges on abilities. And that's one of our favorite tricks. Whether it be finding ways to get the most value out of Apotheosis or simply pumping out smites to get your Holy Word chastised back up, it feels good. Holy is swiftly finding its way into the hearts of Priest mains, and we're confident that any healer would have a good time with it. All rogues are scoundrels, and don't even get me started on the class they play. As a rogue, your goal is to fight dirty. You take cheap shots, blind the enemy, and you strategically retreat when you don't like the odds. Rogues make use of energy and combo points. Energy is used on abilities that generate combo points, and those combo points are spent on your most devastating abilities. 
Rogues are more vulnerable than most other classes, and they need to leverage every advantage they can get. Rogue's hero talents are largely passive, but they do just enough to warrant your attention. The first option is Fatebound, which causes you to passively flip a coin whenever you use a finisher. Each time the coin lands on the same face, you get a stacking buff. Deathstalker causes Ambush to apply three stacks of a mark to the target, with finishers consuming a stack to trigger additional damage. The Trickster Tree causes your primary attack to also strike with an unseen blade, and every four blades enhances your next finisher. Despite having a lot of similar utility, each rogue spec does have a unique flavor to it. Subtlety rogues are WoW's ultimate tacticians. Thematically, they're all about emerging from the shadows to ambush an unsuspecting victim, and this takes the form of shadow dance setups in their play. Premeditation is a core part of Sub, both the talent, but also, like, the actual thing. Sub rogues make plans to murder the enemy, and they need to execute those plans. If it doesn't work, they make a new plan. Subtlety is by far the harder melee to master because it requires so much awareness and so much game knowledge to really get anything done. You need to know your win conditions and you need to identify which targets are out of defensive options. This means that the spec's floor may be the lowest of any of them. If you suck on sub rogue, you're going to feel worse than useless whereas the best rogues can thrive on sub no matter the meta. So, if you're someone who's willing to put in the work in order to be the most dangerous person in the lobby, then sub rogue definitely gonna be for you. Next up, Assassination. It's a spec themed around bleed and poison effects, and we see it as a great entry point into rogues. Assass touches on all of the same elements as Sub Rogue without you needing to fully embrace burst setups. The spec is more known for its consistent damage, but also is encouraged to multi-dot the enemy for resources and some minor rod pressure. Assass can then make use of damage amplifiers like Deathmark and Shiv for burst damage, and as a result, Assass Rogues feel plenty roguish, but you can still play it closer to a traditional melee. So, if you like setups, Assass Rogue's got you. If you like consistent single-target pressure, Assass has got you. If you like multi-dotting rot damage, Assass has got you. Finally, Outlaw is essentially a pirate-themed spec, and it's a spec made for those people who complain on Reddit about how the game has been dumbed down. Of the Rogue specs, it's closer to a warrior or a demon hunter staying in the fight and pumping out consistent pressure. In theory, that ought to make it mindless compared to a spec like Sub, but Outlaw Rogue's rotation is absolutely notoriously difficult. It's filled with procs, and most of your rotational abilities feature cooldown reduction. In chaotic periods, it's super easy to lose track of abilities or just make really bad inputs. And on top of that, you've got Roll the Bones and your hero talents both after your attention. Outlaw Rogue can absolutely humble you, even just sitting in town, whacking a target dummy. So in the chaos of Arena, it's rare that you're going to play perfectly. Now, this makes it one of the rarest specs in PvP, but that makes it novel. So if you love a challenge and you want to stand out from the crowd, it's hard to do much better than Outlaw Rogue. Shaman in World of Warcraft commune with both their spiritual ancestors, but also the elements. Now, what does that mean in practice? Well, it means lightning, lava, healing rain, and rock elements, baby. Shaman can perform the role of melee or range DPS and as a healer. Totems are a defining feature for the class, typically serving as utility or defensive cooldowns. Now, on the whole, one of the first things you notice about Shaman is how much utility the spec has to offer. Now, the ideal Shaman player is the dad who overpacks for every single camping trip. No matter what strange thing you may need, he's got it immediately on hand. Now, in PvP, what you're asking for is typically some form of disruption. Shaman have so many ways to make life harder for the enemy. Whether it's preventing a critical hammer of justice with grounding totem, or just bullying the enemy healer with purges and wind shears. For hero talents, the trees are appropriately shaman-y, but they're not earth-shattering. 
Farseer, abilities have a chance to summon an ancestor that casts similar spells to you and provides an empowered version of nature swiftness. Stormbringer, a lightning-themed build that upgrades Lava Burst to Tempest. And Totemic, which provides Shaman with two additional totems, Surging and Searing Totem. So Enhancement is Shaman's melee DPS spec. The Shaman, quote, enhances their weapons with elemental effects and combines melee attacks with magic effects. Enhance plays a little like an outlaw rogue if it were less punishing, magic, and had a bit more emphasis on support. Attacks have a chance to grant stacks of Maelstrom weapon with five stacks allowing the Shaman to instantly cast certain spells. So these are a kind of combo point system that Shamans play around. Enhance can play in a variety of different ways based on how it's tuned. Over the years, it has seen success in a kind of support role that emphasized the spec's off-healing and its disruption. It's also done quite well with setups built around Doom Winds, allowing the spec to put out devastating bursts. But at the time of writing here, Enhanced Shamans are seeing the most success by relying on consistent damage and leaning on their improved defensive kit to outlast the enemy. So while we really enjoy Enhance here, you may want to check out our most recent tier list to see how the class is faring before you commit to it. Elemental is the caster DPS specialization for Shaman. Elemental is an unrelenting damage machine, and while some caster specs are all about control and precision, Elemental is gleefully chaotic. Elemental's resource system is similar to Shadow Priest. They spread Flame Shock, and use basic abilities to generate Maelstrom, which they spend on Earthshock. Elemental Shaman's damage is extremely spiky. Shaman's Mastery gives their abilities a chance to trigger a second time at a reduced effectiveness. And once you factor in crit chance and other procs, it's kind of like you're playing a slot machine, and when you hit the jackpot, your target dies. This alone is enough for players to really enjoy themselves playing Elemental, but being so unpredictable can also help you in combat. You're able to threaten players essentially at random, and that's going to force your opponent to make really bad cooldown trades. This allows Elemental to thrive in solo shuffle, where they can just put the screws to the enemy healer by hitting whoever happens to be in range. This all makes Elemental an approachable caster that we'd recommend to just about anyone. And finally, for Shaman, let's talk about Restoration. Resto Shaman is a healing spec that we've always had a soft spot for, and if you love keybinding, boy is it the spec for you. As a healer, they are what we call an interactive healer, a spec that typically can't just sit back and keep health bars filled. For Resto Shaman, prevention is the best medicine. You typically want to use Shaman's various disruption effects to protect your team before things get out of hand. Now defensively, this means grounding key cast, rooting the enemy melee, and so on. But Shaman feels the best when you're on offense, using kicks, purges, and crowd control to harass the enemy healer. Resto Shaman's healing rotation is rather simple with an emphasis on instant cast spells and passive abilities. Now things get more complicated if the Shaman falls behind, but Resto has a huge kit of cooldowns to take advantage of. Some might look at these spells and say, well, who has the time? But Resto Shaman mainly looks at this and sees the burden of possibility. They see the weight of potential. We love Resto Shaman, and we hope you do too. Warlocks are the purple class now. While PD is going to tell you that warlocks are all about demonic magic, fire, and brimstone. That sort of thing. But to be a Warlock main, the one skill you need is an unwavering Victim Complex. Between your three specs, you're going to always have one in the top five DPS, but you need to find it within yourself to believe that the world is against you. Similar to Hunters, Locks get a permanent demon as a pet, with each of them offering a unique ability. Warlocks use Soul Shards as a resource system, generating shards through various effects and spending them on major abilities depending on their spec. Now in the modern game, warlocks play quite a bit like mages. Despite being clothies, both are quite durable and warlocks have deceptive mobility with demonic circle and gateway. Warlocks hero talents are fairly interesting, but honestly, they're really not amazing either. 
Hellcaller transforms the Warlock's key dot into Wither, a somewhat complex debuff that's most notable for being instant cast and on a different spell school to Shadow. Diabolist is a hero talent themed around summoning even greater demons than demonology, with the Warlock regularly summoning one of three major demons to assist them. Soul Harvester has a lot of lore going on with it, but what matters is this is the hero talent with all the Nightfall buffs for Affliction. Affliction is a Warlock spec themed around inflicting curses and other magical debuffs on the enemy. It's a great choice for anyone looking to play a caster that wrecks havoc on the enemy healer. Now, in recent years, Affliction was arguably the only true rot-based DPS. Rather than spreading their dots to generate resources, Affliction aimed to kill the enemy team with split pressure. What's interesting is that the spec has done almost a complete 180 recently. In The War Within, Affliction now has very potent single-target damage, including enormous bursts that come from pooling Nightfall procs. That's right, and we had to make multiple burst guides this time around for Affliction Warlock, of all things. And while the spec is now single-target focused, it still has enough support for multi-dotting that you can start to generate rot pressure as dampening starts to ramp up. So, Affliction appears to be in a really good spot going forward, and while it may have caused the spec to lose some of its unique flavor to it, we think Aph still feels distinct from other casters. Demonology is another caster that plays like very little else. It's probably the best example of a caster that's oriented around ramping damage, and it's going to appeal to you if you want a little more prep to your burst and a little less stress once it starts. Demonology Warlocks go all in on the whole demon thing, too. They sub out the wimpy Fell Hunter for the Giga Chad Felgar and summon hordes of lesser demons to overwhelm the enemy. In previous expansions, Demonology has been a very intimidating spec for new players, with a relatively complex rotation, pet management, and a reliance on setups. Blizzard's definitely worked hard to rein all that in, though, and Demo has become a much more simple spec to play in The War Within. We aren't in love with the changes here, but Demo retains the elements that we find so appealing about the spec, and rather than traditional damage modifiers, Demo's burst damage comes from summoning as many demons as possible and extending their duration with Demonic Tyrant. This means that Demo locks are more concerned with the ramp up than other specs, but once the damage is rolling, Demo Warlocks get to sit back and maybe go for a fear and just admire your work. Destruction Warlock is a caster DPS in your very classic wizard mold. If you looked at Demo and thought, well, this is just a fireball with extra steps, then Destro is definitely going to be the spec for you. Destruction is the spec that has historically been built around Chaos Bolt, but as it turns out, no one has any fun when Chaos Bolt is too strong. Opponents put all their effort into stopping it, so Warlocks can spend all game just trying to get two cast off in succession. So between Dragonflight and The War Within, Destruction has shifted away from a dependence on Chaos Bolt and more towards instant cast spells. This has made Destro more pleasant to play, but the spec has found itself without an obvious real identity in Arena. This is aggravated by hero talents as well, with Hellcaller making Destro feel more like Affliction and Diabolist making Destro feel like Demonology. But you know what specs we do like? Affliction and Demonology. And as it stands, Destro is great for players who enjoy those specs and want an insurance policy against bad tuning. Warriors are your classic fighter types. Because of that, they provide a great example of the principles and appeal of PvP itself. You roll a warrior to Zug, but you main a warrior for its poise. Put another way, don't be fooled into thinking that warrior is a mindless class. Warriors have an extensive kit of utility with short cooldowns that aren't flashy, but all of these abilities can be devastatingly efficient when they're used correctly. Whether you spell reflect a hodge or you land the perfect disarm, these are huge plays that slowly tip the scales into your favor. Now, this is a core appeal of PvP, the rush of winning a moment. No complex strategy, just get in there and outplay the other guy. There's something beautiful about that. 
Now, when it comes to hero talents, Colossus grants the warrior a new ability called Demolish. This channeled attack is similar to Monk's Fist of Fury, and it notably provides immunity to stuns. Next is Slayer, which expands support for Execute, and attacks have a chance to mark the target for execution, buffing Execute's damage, and granting additional sudden death procs. Finally, Mountain Thane is a thunder and lightning themed spec that essentially just causes you to zap the enemy a bunch. Arms Warriors are what we think of when we picture a warrior in PvP, so when we talk about the beautiful simplicity of warriors in PvP, we're definitely picturing an Arms Warrior. Arms Warrior plays like how you imagine a warrior would play. You generate rage, you spend it, maintain rend and hamstring, get execute procs, and that's really about it. Their signature ability, Mortal Strike, has been a mainstay of PvP since the game's inception. The rotation has been polished to a shine. It does just enough to keep you engaged without distracting from the higher level stuff. Now, we've already mentioned Warrior's approach to utility, and the offensive kit of ARMS has a similar thing going on with it. ARMS has six different offensive cooldowns, and they're all very short. And as a result, you always have some kind of minor setup available to you every 30 seconds or so, typically aligned with Stormbolt and Colossus Smash. These provide you with consistent opportunities to force your opponents to make inefficient trades. Now, this isn't unique to ARMS, but there's really something pure about it. You know exactly what you're going to get with ARMS, and you're going to get the quintessential melee experience. Fury Warriors are Berserkers. In the modern game, Fury and ARMS share almost identical utility, but Fury manages to maintain quite a different feel to it. From a rotation perspective, Fury captures the theme of wildly just flailing at the enemy. The spec has relatively few buttons, but is deliberately overloaded with stacking buffs and procs to keep you on your toes. And while it's relatively easy for ARMS warriors to swap targets, Fury has three different buffs that incentivize them to pick and stick to a target. Fury's offensive cooldowns are similar to ARMS, but they have a different texture that we won't really get into here. Fury's been consistently popular for the last few seasons, and we expect it to stay that way in The War Within. And we wouldn't be shocked to learn that the average warrior prefers it over ARMS at the moment. If you're wanting to get started and rank up fast on any of the classes that we covered today, check out our brand new website at skillcap.com. Our guides are designed to get you ahead by teaching fundamentals that actually carry in arena. We've even leveled up our revolutionary add-on, which with the click of a button can give you the number one UI for PvP in just a matter of seconds. So to get started with everything you need in the new expansion, be sure to check the exclusive offer below and learn how you can gain 400 rating risk-free. For now though, that wraps it up for this one. Good luck in the new season, and we'll see you soon.